One of the features of this uh, conference has been the imposition of titles of presentations on the speakers, yes. to which they have all um, responded generously in most cases, a bit of aggro in one or two cases. But um, I was the one who suggested this to our next speaker, who is Alan Greer, the Associate Professor in Politics and Public Policy at the University of West England in Bristol. I'm not sure we're allowed to say that he just retired. You're, he's now Associate Professor Emeritus, I take it. Um, okay. Um, he's the convener of, of the Irish Politics Group of the Political Studies Association and an active member of the Political Studies Association of Ireland, to whose meeting I believe he is on his way tomorrow um, in Waterford. His 1999 study of the early development of Stormont has given him a, consume, a continuing interest or should have anyway, in the de devolution process, particularly as it applies to policy and legislation in the critical areas of agriculture, food, and rural policy. What I wanted him to do was working out from his study of Stormont to look at what has been happening in relation, because Stormont, of course, while it's not technically a devolved parliament in the proper sense of the word in recent times, it is devolved. Um, and the devolution has meant, of course, that issues come down to the more local level, and one of those is agriculture. Um, so in, in, in actual fact, in certain areas of Ireland, if you were to set up a parliament, there would only be one department of state, and that would be the Department of Agriculture. Um, and what I wanted him to, to, to do was to tell us how he sees from that Stormont um, initiation, the, the building of Stormont, which raises issues about location and scale and the interests of people, and then move on to how it has handled and other areas have handled the process of devolution and how it impacts, particularly in the area of agriculture. So I now give you Dr. Alan Greer. Right. Thank you, Dennis. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, just to say I'm a political scientist. I, um, the first... Actually, I was thinking about this title. I probably would have put devolution second. That might make more sense. But, um, and I, after, after listening to some of the other presentations, I was thinking I could have also called it a, a house with three lives in relation to Stormont um, because it has had some uh, you know, really uh, distinct periods over the years. So I spent most of the 1980s um, writing a doctorate at Queen's University in Belfast on farming politics in Northern Ireland during the Stormont period. And one of the sort of serendipitous sort of side effects of that was when you're, burnt, as you know, when you beaver away in archives, it gets t tremendously boring, particularly when it's about it, administrative politics of agriculture. So I started finding stuff which were debates about the building of Stormont, and I took all the references and filed it away. And then about a few, few years later, in the uh, late 90s, when I was, you know, I'd finished and written up most of my doctorate stuff, I decided I'll go back and I'll write this paper up on, 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 on Stormont, which is what I did. So I'm going to, in this, just basically say something about the context. So really the context is going to be stuff that sort of Brian alluded to about the Government of Ireland Act. Then I'm going to say why is it Stormont? Um, and why the building was was put there and not elsewhere. And then there's a section about building Stormont, and that's mainly about the controversies that surrounded uh, the construction of the building. And then I'm going to move on and say something about the politics that actually took place within Stormont. So the second part becomes the more political. The first part's the ar architecture part, and the second part's the more politics part. And as I used to say, I've been an agricultural policy specialist for, you know, 30, 40 years now um, and writing, you know, a lot of publications on that, on, you know, in both an Irish, a British and a European perspective. I thought I'd say something about that. And there is a slide on the future, but it's a bit controversial, so I'm not sure I'll, I will go into that. Um, but we will see. So firstly, um, I... This is um, just referring to the Government of Ireland Act, which um, Brian alluded to. And here we have Lloyd George, who's the Welsh wizard. And uh, he's got a map of Ireland, and he's obviously presented as a, as a magician on the stage, or a wizard on the stage. And uh, you may not be able to see it, it's called The Kindest Cut of All. And it, his, his, the quote for Lloyd George is, I now proceed to cut this map into two parts and place them in the hat. 
After a suitable interval, they will be found to have come together of their own accord. And then the aside is, at least I hope so, I've not done this trick before, which is a sort of an interesting sort of, you know, summary really of the ideas behind the Government of Ireland Act, which was, you know, originally to create two separate parliaments, North and South, and create an Irish councillor, a council of Ireland, which would, in some miraculous way, over time, evolve into a, a more of a, uh, an Irish parliament, which would then gradually take over more and more functions from the two devolved assemblies. But of course, as from about 1925, as we know, the, the Council of Ireland was essentially dead. And both parts of Ireland then, um, after that, developed you know, in their own different but similar ways in some respects. Um, I don't know, it would be an interesting thing to work out whether there was any bones ever put on the flesh of what an Irish council would be like, whether the, I need to go back to the Government of Ireland Act and look and see, I'm sure agriculture and animal health and things like that would have been some of the key um, issues that it would have dealt with. Whether there was been ideas about whether there would be a building I have no idea whether they thought we'd have a building for the Council of Ireland or whether it would be something akin to what we have today, which is a North-South Ministerial Council, which meets in different places at different times. So that's another interesting sort of aspect, which, um, you know, which I, uh, you know, some people might know something about, which I certainly don't. But um, So the context then is that after partition, there was a need in Northern Ireland to construct a new state or a new state architecture. Uh, and this would, it was assumed would be mainly in Belfast. Now Belfast, of course, unlike Dublin, was the, was the industrial and commercial centre. So it didn't have existing buildings, unlike Dublin, um, that were suitable for the location of a new parliament. So the reality was always going to be that in Belfast they were going to have to build a new building somewhere. Um, and they also had to build, of course, other, other government offices and other state buildings to house all the, the departments and the administration, because they didn't have those either. Um, and another interesting example that goes parallel to Stormont, for example, uh, is the, the design and construction of the Royal Courts of Justice, which is in central Belfast, and that was built again in the 1920s and opened in 1933. So generally speaking, the approach that was taken was that was an ad hoc approach. So they pushed, the, some buildings were inherited from the existing administration, but not many. Some were bought and converted for office use and others were rented. So well, I'm going to focus primarily on parliament buildings, but there, of course there were all the, all the other administrative offices to house the six departments of of the Northern Ireland government that had to be created at the same time. <clears throat> now, the original thinking of the Northern Ireland government, so really there are three sets of players, and this is the Northern Ireland government, and the, the most fundamentally important person in that was the pr first Prime Minister, Sir James Craig, or Lord Craig Adam, and also some of the key um, administrative secretaries, uh, such as Sir Ernest Clark. The, cabinet secretary I think and the original thinking was what we'll do is we'll put all the buildings government parliament judiciary on one site and then they will all be located together and that's that was the original thinking so the, thick, the next point is then okay if they wanted to do that put all the government uh, the state buildings essentially on the one site where were they going to put it because there wasn't really anywhere in the centre of Belfast that you could put it. So there were practical considerations that worked against using Belfast centre as, a, as the centre for the new parliament. But there were also two other important factors. One was the rivalry between the new government and Belfast City Council, which was also unionist controlled. And there was, of course, Belfast City Hall, as you know, is a rather imposing building um, in its own right. Um, and there was a, a sort of a rivalry between key figures in the new government, such as Craig, who wasn't a Belfast man, he was from County Down. Um, it's the key rivalry between those and city and urban interest. 
And the other thing, of course, is that, um, as you can see from this quote, so a lot of these quotes, I've got the reference in the article, this all came out in at the end of the paper. A lot of it comes from um, Northern Ireland cabinet records of the time. So in 1921, the Northern Cabinet had agreed that the site for Parliament public offices should be parkland outside the centre of Belfast in order to give room for future extension, in other words, to give flexibility to expand as government expanded, but also crucially to help maintain independence from urban influence. So there was a key cleavage in Northern Ireland at this time between urban interests and rural interests, between say the linen manufacturers and the farmers or the and the shipbuilders and the city interests and the urban interests and they are basically saying that the parliament can't be in belfast because it's a parliament for the whole of northern ireland not for belfast and they then decide actually we'll better look for somewhere which is outside the boundaries of the city to construct the new parliament um, so why did they choose Stormont? So as we know, Stormont essentially is used as shorthand for the Northern Ireland political system. Stormont actually is a district of East Belfast now, today. It's the Stormont area. Um, but we tend to just say the Stormont government or the Stormont regime because the, the government became essentially um, identified with the area in which the parliament was situated and met. Um, but as with, uh, you know, the developments in, in the Republic or in the Republic, uh, more than one site was considered. So they looked at several sites um, in the environs of Belfast. These are mainly in East uh, Belfast, Beaver Park and Orangefield, which were, and all of these really were essentially landed estates. And Beaver Park is a nice golf course. Now. Um, Beaver Park was actually the favourite site of the government, but it was regarded as too expensive. Uh, so what they did in the end was they bought an existing estate, which was the Stormont Castle and its estate in the Stormont area, which was, and it was then well outside the city boundary. So if you go to Stormont now, you think, well, you're in the city. Of course, you're in the city and you're in Belfast. You're about three miles from the city centre. Maybe, yeah, three probably. But at that time, Stormont was well outside the city boundary and it was regarded as a suitable place, or at least the government no, no, the government thought it was a suitable place to put its new um, buildings. And in fact, in order to secure um, the storm at the state, it was bought actually for 20,000. Um, and Craig actually, the Prime Minister, actually took a loan out from his bank of 3,000 pounds to pay the deposit. And I've put illegally in here because actually it wasn't the decision of the Northern Ireland government at all. Technically, decisions about where the parliament would be, what it would be, were decisions for the UK government, and particularly the Office of Works, the Office of Public Works, in consultation with the Treasury. So this actually also caused a lot of sort of convolution within government circles in London because they thought Craig was going off on a tangent. He's, he's doing things, he's tying us into developments in areas that we not, haven't actually agreed to yet. Um, so that's when, you know, they, they basically, um, in early sort of 21, 22, I think, Stormont Castle, and Stormont Castle is still there, of course, and people get confused with Stormont Castle is the castle that's on the estate, but lower down from parliament buildings. It's more Scottish baronial in style. And that was the residence of the Prime Minister of Northern Ireland and, and the, now of the Secretary of State when under, under uh, direct rule. Um, I don't know what they use it for when devolution's running, I'll have to think about that. Uh, at the same time, also Hillsborough Castle, an estate of 1,100 acres, were purchased for £25,000 as the site of the residence of the Governor, because Northern Ireland, of course, still remained within the Empire, uh, unlike. <coughs> Uh, the Republic, uh, the Free State, or Republic, and um, it had it, it had the governor. So there was this sort of general, um, you know, process of finding appropriate places. Hillsborough's a good bit further out, of course, even even uh, even further out than Stormont. So 
So Craig, this is a quote from Craig, he said, the view from the top of the hill is one of the finest in the neighbourhood. This is of Stormont, facing south. The well-timbered grounds will afford pleasure to the local inhabitants when transformed into a public park. This is actually one of the most insightful things he did. Because if you go past Stormont at any day, you'll see people walking their dogs in the ground. It's very open, it's very inclusive. You can go in and walk in the grounds. I played cricket in Belfast when I was younger, and I played matches against Northern Ireland Civil Service, and I played at Stormont. And you went down the main drive, and you went in, and, and in fact, when Ireland play cricket matches these days, they play at Stormont. They play some of them at Stormont, on the cricket grounds in Stormont. So it, it does actually still have an element of inclusivity for the local people. People walk their dogs in it, people play sport in it, and so on. Uh, but that, that's in the park, obviously, around, around Stormont. Now, there was, of course, also, none surprising, much hostility within Northern Ireland to the choice of Stormont as a, a site for the new parliament. There were really two elements of opposition. One was from the business and commercial and urban interests, who felt that Stormont was far too far out of, outside the city um, and too, inex too remote and too inaccessible for the public in terms of interacting with the government. And uh, I can remember, certainly if I was reading through Ulster Farmers' Journals of the 1920s, which is the journal of the Ulster Farmers' Union, and there was uh, week after week of complaints by farmers about Parliament being located at Stormont, because they said, when we come into Belfast, we want to be able to do our work quickly and then go back again. But of course, they were in horse and carts, they weren't in cars. And they're going to take, you know, actually have to go out another three miles outside the city to go out to Stormont and back. So, what they actually did in those cases was they put some offices in the centre of Belfast. So you ended up getting this rather messy compromise, but particularly in the administrative sense, between government offices being located in Belfast, some civil servants, particularly for things like agriculture and commerce, and some government offices being located at Stormont. Um, the second one also, of course, was, as you would expect, were by the nationalist politicians, such as Joe Devlin. And Joe Devlin, the famous uh, Belfast nationalist, actually memorably described Stormont as the palace in no man's land. And there was a lot of criticism. In fact, I think one of my earliest versions of this, the paper that I wrote was called The Palace in No Man's Land. So Devlin said it was the palace in no man's land and the symbol of permanent division in this country. And that's sort of just, a, you know, there's a lot of other um, nationalist critique uh, around the choice of Stormont, but that really boils down to actually having a separate parliament at all, not really where it's located. Um, so they decided then that they would build the parliament uh, buildings. So they are technically called parliament buildings, is the formal word. So we shorthanded Stormont because that's the area where they're, where they're centred. So Parliament buildings as it exists today were designed by Arnold Thornley. Um, I've put the Liver building, that's not right. It was the other one of the three graces. It was the Port of Liverpool Authority building, I think, that he designed. And also Wallasey Town Hall. So he's quite a well-known um, English architect of the time. And the original design really was supposed to be a Trinitarian composition, as it was described, with two wings either side of the Parliament. So you would have the main parliament building and then two wings slightly lower down the hill. One was for government and one was for the judiciary. And the wing buildings were actually designed, but as you'll see, never built, but they were designed by Ralph Knott, who also designed County Hall in London, which is also actually now a hotel. So go back to your um, thing about um, public buildings becoming hotels. That's, that's another one. And as I say, there was opposition. There was a really good quote that I have in, in my paper, I think, in the UK government from one civil servant who said, on basis of separation of powers alone, he didn't think it was a good idea to have the judiciary, the government and the parliament all on the one side. Um, and, and in the end, they, they didn't do that. Um, so it became clear very quickly that the wings would be government offices. Uh, and the judiciary then went to the Royal Courts of Justice in central Belfast. I'm sorry. Um, 
interestingly, when I first, I wrote a, 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 an early iteration of this paper, which was really just a description of Craig and the interaction, and then I sent it off to Irish Historical Studies, and the editor at the time was a great man, Keith Jeffrey, a great um, political historian in the North, said, why don't you set this in the tradition of imperial architecture? So I went off and did a lot of reading about architectural history and about imperial architecture and looked at things and really became quite clear that the, the architects were very influenced by some of the other empire architectures that were going on at the time, particularly designed by people like Lutyens and Herbert Baker, uh, such as in places like Pretoria, New Delhi. So, you know, Canadian um, and Australian parliament houses and, and also uh, state capitals and things like that. The one that I found that was closest, I think, to the original design was Pretoria, the Union buildings in Pretoria, which basically have three, three a Trinitarian composition, although the two wings are linked by a colonnade. And you wouldn't have been able to do that in Belfast because the two wings were lower down the hill and Parliament building was at the top. At least it would have cost a hell of a lot more money than they were prepared to spend. So the construction of Parliament buildings was eventually approved in 1921, uh, but they didn't begin until 1928, and it was opened by King George V in 1932, I think. Or was it the Prince of Wales? Between 1921 and 1932, uh, the first meeting of the Northern Ireland Parliament took place in Belfast City Hall. So the council did at least agree to lease them out for the opening meeting. And after that, it met in the, what we call the Presbyterian, the Presbyterian Churches Assemblies College buildings, which are at the back of Queen's University, back of the main Lanyon building, just before the entrance into Botanic Park, if you, if you know your Belfast. Um, and that's quite interesting also, because in fact, in Scotland, um, when the Scottish Parliament was meeting after 1999, before Holyrood was built, it also met in the Presbyterian College buildings in Edinburgh, in the Royal Mile. So there is a, a, a couple of nice, um, you know, um, overlaps. Now, this is the original drawing. It's a bit, to get it in, it came, I have it on a picture, which has been hanging in my office, because the, art, the editor of IHS at the time said, why don't you go to London? It's too elongated, you know, obviously. Um, but... Um, he said, why don't you go and see if you can find any original plans? So I took myself up to London for the day, went to the Reba uh, Library, went through all sorts of architects' journals from the early 20s and found this. There are also a lot of, and to my shame, I didn't take any photocopies, there are lots of internal drawings, you know, about what the interior um, would and should have looked like. But you can see from this, basically, this is Thornery's original design in 1923, which is um, for the main parliament building. And it's essentially three floors and the dome, and then it's classical, neoclassical design with the, the, the colonnades and the columns. But as I say, it's, it's too stretched. Um, I used to, I, I got the, pin, the picture back and framed it, and it's been hanging in my office in Bristol for 20 years until I've taken it home now and put it in my study because I've, I've vacated that office. But I used to put, I used to use it and put a, a little postcard of the, of what Parliament buildings looks like today in the bottom. And when students come in, I'd say, what's the difference? And they'd look at it and look at it and look at it and they'd say, I'm not sure, I'm not sure. I says, well, there's no dome. And they go, oh, of course there's no dome. So um, that's sort of um, how it was supposed to be. So why was the building as planned not built? Well, delays were caused originally by technical matters including, as I say, Stormont's quite a hilly site, so, and the government wanted to build at the top of the hill. And Craig got approval of Parliament, mainly the Unionist Party, of course, um, on the basis that the Parliament would be built at the top of the hill, and also that Stormont Castle would not be demolished. But it was also beset by internal political disputes, and also importantly by financial disputes with the UK government, or the UK Exchequer. So it was stipulated in the Government of Ireland Act that a figure of £1 million each would be provided by the UK Exchequer for each of the new parliaments in Ireland, north and south. And that was for all of the buildings, actually, not just the parliament, it was for all of the new public buildings. 
Now, Craig, interestingly, argued that's not fair because Dublin's already got big buildings that it can use and we haven't any, so we need more money. So that was his typical, you know, very classic influence in Craig. The specific figure was actually moved out of the Government of Ireland Act as a result of unionist pressure. Uh, but, and, but this was a fundamental influence on Craig and the Unionist government, and it led to tensions between it and the Treasury. So the cost then is, of course, debates about the cost of new public buildings commonplace. For example, the Scottish Parliament. I don't think the Welsh one was so went so much over budget. I'm not sure Richard Rogers designed that one, I think. Um, Initial rough estimates suggest that the total cost of the UK Exchequer of providing public buildings <coughs> in Northern Ireland would be approximately 1.25 million. In August 22, the estimate using the higher site was revised upwards to 1.35. By 1925, the Treasury was estimating the total cost at 1.7 million and professing an alarm that it might reach 3 million. And then essentially what happened was it was clear from very early on that the Treasury was very concerned about its liability for costs and expenditure. So this is a quote from a Treasury official in the, in the government files. Total expenditure to the taxpayer in creating this government will be very considerably larger than we had originally contemplated. It is the danger of their opening their mouths at the expense of the imperial taxpayer, which prompts me to favour, if it be possible, a lump sum a lump sum payment to be quit of all obligations. And then he says quite accurately, but I'm sure Craig won't accept this. Of course, he didn't. He just said, no, you've, you've agreed to pay for it, so you'll pay for it. You know, so that's, that was how he did it. Um, so the Treasury really tried to get out the Northern Ireland government either to accept the lump sum to reduce the costs or to put a date limit on its liabilities, uh, both of which were rejected. It then moved to saying, either build the parliament lower down, where it isn't so um, you know, technically difficult. That wasn't acceptable because it then didn't have the requisite grandeur of the building at the top of the hill, which Craig thought they were creating. Um, and, even, and if you built on the lower site, Stormont Castle would have to be demolished. And the Unionist Party, when they approved Stormont, said, under no circumstances can Stormont Castle be abolished, so they couldn't do that. So the Treasury really said, we'll have to either, if you can't do that, then we'll have to alter the plans to provide what they called a more functional building. And the also, this was also resisted by the government. And, but it was interesting in the debates between the three, the Office of Works and Craig were quite on the same side most of the time. So the Office of Works said the general aspect of this group of buildings should command respect and appeal to the sentiment and imagination of the community. Um, it will re be regretted if we stall in the, install in the new Irish Parliament uh, in buildings for which lack of spaciousness and dignity contrasts most unfavourably with municipal buildings in our big towns. The difference between the outlay between a cheap building and a handsome building is reverently small. The difference between a min mean building and one of strength and character is incalculable. So basically, um, to be quickly through this, in 1925, in the UK then, of course, you had a lot of public sector, uh, public expenditure retrenchment at the time of the Geddes Acts. And they basically said, everybody's having to take a hit. So you've got to take a hit on the, on, on the, on the public buildings in Northern Ireland. So the design, after protracted negotiations between the Northern Government and the Treasury, the original design was radically changed. So the wing buildings were scrapped. The dome was scrapped. Uh, and because the wing buildings were in a whole government offices, they put an extra floor in to hold the civil servants, which actually then is another interesting thing because you've now got administrators and MPs on the same site in the same building, which some of the writers on that say was quite an important influence on how politics worked in Northern Ireland at the time. So some... Uh, and then one of the interesting things that came about from the result of this was the construction of a processional road. So if you look down, you see the road that goes down, uh, which is about a mile long, up to the statue of Carson outside the building. Really should be a statue of Craig, because Carson had very little to do with the this construction of the building. Um, so there was a lot of internal unionist party criticism about the types of employment opportunities available, mainly for unskilled workers. 
And so what they decided to do was they, they, they did a bit of a trade-off. They said, we'll agree to a less functional building if we can build this driveway. And then you could use a lot of labourers and unskilled labourers particularly to help build the road. And there was also actually a lot of debates within the Northern Government about where the materials for the building came from. So Craig has ever wanted to use Irish or Northern Irish stuff like uh, more and granite and so on, but instead they were using Portland stone and uh, you know things like that. So this is obviously what, what we got in here. You can see the per people walking their dogs, so that's the park. Um, and this is the professional processional driveway and a couple of joggers and uh, the usual. So you can see here the dome has disappeared, uh, an extra floor has been built, and the wing buildings were never were never built. So the symbolism for Craig was um, public and political administrative structures had to be of a scale that would inspire confidence in and a feeling of permanence about the new polity. So it's all about establishing Northern Ireland as a permanent or a, at least a, you know, over 100 years, whatever, um, as a political system that is going to last, not one that is going to be ephemeral and then merge into some sort of putative uh, All-Ireland Parliament through a Council of Ireland. So partly for Craig, the whole thing about the external buildings was to show that Northern Ireland was, well, this is a quote from Craig, there had to be a dignity about our Parliament. The roots of that Parliament must be deeply seated in Ulster soil, so that no opponents at any time come forward and say, I do not refer to the architectural structure, the real moral structure, that it is only a small affair and we can easily sweep it to one side. So he's trying to use that. Um, and Pollock, of the Minister of Finance, Stormont was the outward and visible proof of the permanence of our institutions. Now, for all time, we are bound indissolubly, indissolubly to the British Crown, which um, you, you probably panic now if you saw census results. But anyway. um, I won't go on to this about the internal design, but basically, because um, Brian covered this about how. Uh, basically, the Northern Ireland Parliament was essentially a mirror image of the Westminster Parliament in most respects. Um, the politics were interesting. So the, par the Parliament was bicameral. Elections originally were by single transferable vote, but were changed in 1925 to the British style first past the post elections, which again as a, you know, is one of the debates in the literature around uh, discrimination. But that really, and most people agree that that's to ensure that there is only one unionist party, not a splintering of unionist parties. Um, because the balance between nationalists and unionists was relatively stable. So the change of the electoral system was to stop working class unionist parties growing up and establishing themselves, some of which at certain times became quite um, important. Political parties, obviously, um, the elections resulted because of the way the system was set up, you know, on a six county basis, not a nine county basis, which of course had originally been discussed in terms of partition. But the unionists at the time said, no, well, we don't want Cavan, Donegal and Monaghan, there's too many Catholics in them. So we will have the six counties that'll give us a more stable basis. So gerrymandering appears on the creation of the state essentially, but not really within it, except in places like Derry which is, you know, where the, the boundaries certainly were rigged. Um, for most of the time, of course, or a lot of the period, it didn't really work in the way it was designed because the opposition, the Nationalist Party, refused to turn up. So they, op they operated an abstentionist policy. So for a lot of the period, it was the Unionists talking and debating amongst themselves um, with the addition, I suppose, of the Northern Ireland Labour Party in the 1960s. So there were periods of, national, of Nationalist uh, engagement, probably in the 20s and again in the 60s, but long periods of abstention. And then there was a whole range of policies that were developed, um, which um, I highlighted in my work on farming as a split between, uh, uh, representing a tension between uniformity and variation, which I'll just say something briefly about when I do have small. So these are the basic, what we know is that go to the bottom storm and, or the Northern Ireland Parliament was abolished in 1972. So devolution, of course, um, is not federalism. It's best, at best, it's quasi-federalism. So any devolved assembly, including the Scottish Parliament, the Welsh Parliament, is created by an act of Parliament at Westminster. 
and theoretically it can be abolished by an act of parliament at Westminster. Whether practically they will do that or not, you know, is, would be another, another matter. So that might be, I could say, well, if you say three lives of three lives of Stormont or three lives, you say the first life is Stormont Castle and Domain as a, you know, as a as a, a landed uh, gentry sort of home in the or, or building. The second life is the is the Northern Ireland Parliament at Stormont between 1921 and 72. And the third one is post agreement, or post seventy two and post Belfast agreement. So in the northern, and I note the Northern Ireland Assembly. This is deliberate. I mean, it's the Scottish Parliament and the Welsh Parliament, but the Northern Ireland Assembly. It's not the Northern Ireland Parliament. It's deliberately described as an assembly, so that the differences between the current dispensation and the Stormont period were clearly demonstrated. I, it's not a Westminster style parliament, it's more of a, supposed to be more of a consensual parliament um, rather than oppositional or adversarial. So obviously, you know, originally there was, as again Brian pointed out, there was a House of Commons and the Senate, a bicameral structure. The House of Commons became the Assembly Chamber and the Senate is used for committee work. Now the difference, the difficulty here is, of course, that when you try to set up like a, what we call in political science a consociational type structure, going back to using STV, trying to represent everyone, what you really need is a is a hemispherical chamber. You know, going from left to right and people in the middle, or nationalist to unionist and people in the middle. But because Stormont was built as a mirror of the House of Commons at Westminster, the actual physical layout doesn't really lend itself that well to um, a more hemispherical structure rather than an adversarial one. So this is how it sort of works. So what they did is they sort of shoehorned in, um, sort of, uh, you, they tried to create a sort of semicircular or hemispherical structure within a rectangular building which is actually obviously quite difficult. Um, there are, at the moment, there are 90 MLAs. There were 106. Uh, the Northern Ireland Parliament was 52. So you double the number, you know, of um, 52 MPs. Senate was 26. This um, is an interesting slide. It's not particularly accurate, but this is all the periods of devolution and direct rules since 1998. So obviously we know that after 1972, there were large periods of, apart from the six months, four months in 1974, between 1972 and 1998, Northern Ireland was governed directly from Westminster. And it, on occasion, Stormont was used, for example, in the early 80s, but it, there was no assembly with lawmaking powers. And that obviously was the attempt to go back to that after the Belfast Agreement. But of course, we know that there have still been long periods of devolution interspersed with direct rule. And of course, at the moment, we are still in a direct rule period where there's an assembly, but it isn't operating. Now, I did a, a, ver a fairly rough calculation. It's very difficult to do, but roughly, I'd say since 1998, there's been 13 years of devolution and nine years of direct rule. Um, you know, so for nearly, <laughs> Um, over, you know, a third of the time, the building hasn't been used in a way that it has been built for. If you do it from 1921, Northern Ireland has had approximately 63 years of self-rule. So that's 40, 37. So again, two thirds, um, no, two thirds self-rule, one third. So you could think, actually, they built this lovely big building and it hasn't been used for what it was built for, for long periods in its existence. And I've said, since opening in 1932, Parliament buildings has been used for its main purposes for about 53 years. Um, you can probably quibble. I mean, I did this very roughly off the top of my head, so my figures might be wrong, but I think the general message is there is that, you know, you have a building that's supposed to be a, a Parliament Assembly building and it's not been used for what it was built for. Um, for long periods of time. I'll just finish very briefly because Dennis did want me to say something on, on this. And I, as I say, my work was all on farming. 
and I looked at the way in which farming politics worked in the period between 1921 and 72, which was the, which we called the Stormont period. Um, there was a dominance, firstly, of, the, of unionist government and civil service and policy. So a lot of the, what was actually done by the government um, was top-down, elite-driven. And in the 20s and 30s, it was really improving breeding and marketing. Of, uh, and marketing. My interests, actually, as a political scientist, have always been on state-farmer relations. So I am interested in the, what you might call, interest intermediation or pressure or lobbying, you know, which you get in Parliament. So um, the main linkage there was the link linkage between the Ulster Farmers Union and the Northern Ireland government or the Ministry of Agriculture, which itself is an interesting case study because De uh, Brian mentioned about DATII, the Department of Agriculture Technical Instruction. That was the only department that existed at the time of partition. So actually that was the one department that had to be partitioned so that you created two, de two separate departments out of one. And the Northern Ireland Agriculture Department struggled for a while because a lot of the civil servants, of course, were working in Dublin and they didn't want to go to Belfast to work. So they had to find new people to staff their agricultural departments. Um, so my, I, I, my argument, essentially what the Northern government did, devolution is an interesting thing. You'd say, what is the essence of devolution? The essence of devolution is to give people the ability to decide to do things in their own way, which may not necessarily be what they overarching national government wants to do. Uh, but it all depends on who's in government, whether it's a unionist party or a nationalist party. So in Scotland under the SNP, we might expect that they will always stress doing things differently. You know, we're not part of England. We're not, you know, we are Scotland. We have different conditions, different structures. This is what we must do. Now, in Northern Ireland, the unionist government tried to say that. But at the same time, they tried to say we're part of the United Kingdom. And this all came about essentially through um, from the late 1930s onwards when British government started paying farmers subsidies. And the unionist government could not have afforded to provide farmers subsidies. So what they had to do increasingly was buy themselves into British Acts of Parliament. So over time, and particularly in the 50s and 60s, what the Northern government's agricultural policy was, was essentially a modified version of what was agreed for, for the UK uh, at Westminster. And they were given a relatively small amount of flexibility to alter that in ways that suited the Northern Ireland case. Whereas the nationalists, of course, argued, you know, we're completely different, we should be showing things differently, not following the British example. And then after Stormont, of course, there's a lot of these, what you see, of course, what you don't see in, when you abolish Parliament, you don't abolish the Ministry of Agriculture. It still exists. It's just that the person who's the political head of the Ministry of Agriculture is now an English politician, not a Northern Ireland one. So they're still there, they're still developing the policies. But the entry into the EU really gave the first, you know, the real opportunity to, um, of course, then, I mean, we are then, all countries are covered by the common agricultural policy. So again, Northern Ireland has a little bit of leeway. For example, in most recently in, in what we call direct payments, the Northern Ireland government, the Scottish government, the Welsh government, the English government all have different systems for paying farmer subsidies. Um, so there is a, a bit of variation. But essentially, I mean, you then begin to get a, a relative, a, some sort of harmonization between North and South. Not that in fact that Northern and Southern agricultural policies were that different, they were actually quite similar. Um, but you get them, they are able to harmonize um, under EU entry. And EU entry also provides a, a, an umbrella where the farmers North and South can start to collaborate in a bit more of an open way. They started to do that in the 60s, but it was always kept very hush-hush. So after the O'Neill, the mass meetings, there were always agricultural um, you know, meetings at the, at the margins. And then in devolution after 1998, of course, you know, Northern Ireland is given back responsibility for agriculture. So I'm, I'm not going to say much more on this, actually. I'm going to finish. Um, this is just an interesting line. This, um, these are a list of the ministers of agriculture in Northern Ireland between 1921 and 72 on the Stormont period. And there were 
uh, eight of them, but if you say, well, the system started to break down in 67. So if we go up to 1967, you've got five ministers, some of whom served for very long periods of time. So Archdale was the first, then Baselbrook, Lord Ventorn was the interlude in the war, then Moore, and then Harry West. So Archdale, Brook and West are all Fermanagh farmers, and Moore is a East Derry farmer. Brook, Moor and West were all chairs of the Ulster Farmers Union. Um, so, actually, what my argument about in my agricultural work was that it was I called it a parentella relationship, which is that normally lobby groups get access to the state through the civil service, but in Northern Ireland, the Ulster Farmers Union got access to the state through its links with the unionist party. <coughs> So I, have, I, I, I found one letter, it was about that size, you know, fell out of a government file when I was, and I thought it was like a eureka moment, you know, it's sort of just made, the, it was absolute cornerstone for my doctrine. And it was written from the Ulster Liberal Club uh, by Brook in about 1929, uh, when the Ulster Farmers Union were going to revise their agricultural policy. And the letter went something like, my dear James, as you know, we in the Farmers' Union are currently um, rewriting our agricultural policy. I am writing to you because I'm anxious that we do not do anything that would be contrary to what the government requires. So, that's it. so I'm going to leave it there, if you don't mind. There is another slide which I, uh, which was about the, um, which I think as a, as you probably heard, I mean, I, I'm basically of Presbyterian extraction from East Andrew. And I might say something that I regret, so I'm not going to stand it. But you can ask me about, partic particularly about the protocols. So. <laughs> so anyway, I think I'll stop there if that's okay. Thank you.